Alrighty, I am Kelsey Atwood, Tour and Public Program Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I am delighted to welcome you to this author's talk. The Society of the Cincinnati is the nation's oldest private patriotic organization. George Washington and the officers of the Continental Army founded the Society at the end of the Revolutionary War to perpetuate the memory and ideals of the American Revolution. The American Revolution Institute of the Society carries out its public mission to promote knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions and public programs, and providing resources to classrooms. Tonight's program is about the Battle of Saratoga. Following the successful expulsion of American forces from Canada in 1776, the British forces were determined to end the rebellion and devised what they believed was a war winning strategy. They were to send General John Burgoyne south to root the Americans and take Albany. When British forces captured Fort Ticonderoga with unexpected ease in July of 1777, it looked as if it was a matter of time before they would break the rebellion in the north. Less than three and a half months later, however, a combination of Continental Army and militia forces, commanded by G Major General Horatio Gates and inspired by the heroics of Benedict Arnold, first were going to surrender his entire army. The American victory stunned the world and changed the course of the war. Our speaker this evening explains in his book how the British plans were undone by a combination of distance, geography, logistics, and a, an underestimation of American leadership and fighting ability. Taking Ticonderoga had misled General John Burgoyne and his army into thinking victory was assured. Saratoga, which began as a British foraging expedition, turned into retreat. The outcome forced the British to rethink their strategy, inflamed public opinion in England against the war, and boosted patriotic morale and led directly to the French-American alliance. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker this evening. Retired Colonel Kevin J. Weddell is a professor of military theory and strategy at the U.S. Army War College, Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. He is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in New York and served 29 years as a combat engineer officer. Throughout his career, he has worked in a variety of command and staff positions in the United States and overseas. He is a veteran of Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm and in Operation Enduring Freedom. Colonel Weddell holds a master's degree in history and civil engineering from the University of Minnesota and a PhD from Princeton University. He is the author of Lincoln's Tragic Admiral, The Life of Samuel Francis DuPont, and The Complete Victory, Saratoga and the American Revolution. The subject of our talk this evening is his second book. So let's get started and please joining, join me in welcoming um, Professor Weddell. Okay, well, thanks, Kelsey, that's, uh, for that wonderful introduction, and greetings from Carlisle. Thanks, all, uh, thanks to everybody for participating on this beautiful evening. It's a real honor uh, to be hosted by the Society of the Cincinnati uh, and the uh, American Revolution Institute. Now, normally I like to start off with some, some great humor, but I found that humor doesn't really come across all that great in this kind of uh, virtual presentation, so I think I'm just going to jump right in. So tonight, what we're gonna do is, is discuss one of the most pivotal military campaigns in American history. The Saratoga campaign included 10 battles and engagements and it lasted almost five months. Now, the campaign was complex, fluid, multidimensional. It was shaped by, by countless interactions and contingencies that played out over hundreds of square miles. And the personalities involved were about as fascinating as any you're ever gonna encounter. But more important than that, it changed the very character of the American Revolution. So my book on Saratoga, which uh, coincidentally is the same title as this presentation, uh, examines the campaign and all of its political, strategic, and military complexity. And, and I dissect the strategy, decision-making, and leadership of the, the key players on both sides. And in the short time we have this evening, we're going to be flying along at wave top level. Uh, I'm going to have to leave out a, a lot of many most important elements of the story, but I'm going to try to set the strategic context and provide an overview of the campaign uh, and its impact on the war. So hopefully uh, we can fill in some gaps during the Q&A and of course I, I hope you read the book. 
So in late August, 1777, Britain's King George III received momentous news. Now the great tidings so thrilled the monarch of Great Britain that he burst into his wife's chambers, waving the message in the air and exclaiming, I have beat them, I have beat the Americans. Now he had just learned that, the Brit that British Lieutenant General John Burgoyne and his army had captured the strategically vital American fortress of Fort Ticonderoga, which sat astride the great Lake Champlain invasion route from Canada. This victory achieved with almost zero casualties convinced the King and his ministers that the military strategy that they put into place the preceding spring that hopefully would end the American Revolution was going according to plan. But less than two months after the King's impromptu celebration, Burgoyne and his army met with an unprecedented disaster and the British were subsequently faced with a very, very different war. So how did this come about and what were the implications of that defeat? Now, if you consider the strengths and weaknesses of both sides, it would seem like the outcome of a war like this would be clear. You know, if you put, if you put the, the, the pluses and minuses on an Excel spreadsheet, it would come out obviously on the, on the side of Great Britain, but that's not necessarily how wars progress. Now, I'm not gonna talk about the causes of the American Revolution, but I do wanna put the campaign into some context uh, with the other military operations that preceded it. So, so first of all, of course, there's the Lexington and Concord, April 75, the shot heard around the world. Uh, the Americans seized Fort Ticonderoga in May of 75. Ethan Allen, Benedict Arnold seized the fort. Ultimately, they'll move the guns to Boston. Um, the Battle of Bunker Hill, that bloody battle that convinced the British that subduing the rebellion would not be easy. Uh, the British uh, put the Howe brothers in command and Washington becomes the commander in chief on the American side after that. Uh, Quebec in se uh, December 75, Americans attempt to take Canada. It's a disaster. Uh, Charleston, February 76, uh, the Brits under uh, Lieutenant General Henry Clinton try and fail to take Charleston. The British will evacuate uh, Boston and move to Halifax, Nova Scotia. In, uh, in America, that happens in May of 76. Uh, of course, they'll come back with a vengeance. Uh, they'll conduct a brilliant joint operation chase Washington out of New York. They'll capture that important port. Uh, and uh, Washington and his army will, will retreat across New Jersey. The army starts to disintegrate uh, and uh, they barely escape destruction uh, when they cross the Delaware uh, into, into the, on, to the West Bank of the Delaware. Uh, uh, the Brits um, try to invade uh, New York from the North. Uh, and they're stopped mainly because of the lateness of the season. Uh, but Benedict Arnold is there again uh, in the major uh, naval uh, battle at the, on Lake Champlain, the Battle of Valcour Island. And Washington is able to uh, basically uh, stop the bleeding uh, by conducting his brilliant uh, twin victories uh, at Trenton and at Princeton in December of 76 and January of 77. So what was the policy and strategy on both sides as we move into 1777? Now strategy, probably one of the most overused and misused words in the English language, at least since I teach strategy, that's, that's what I think. Um, the definition is really pretty simple. Strategy is the calculated application of ways and means to achieve a political objective. Sounds really simple. But if it was, we'd be a lot better at it. In reality, it's very, very, very difficult. So the, the policy objectives, the, the political objectives for both sides, Americans, of course, they want independence. On the British side, it's suppress the rebellion, return to the status quo. And of course, the king, the king is very obstinate. He says to treat with independence can never be possible. So he doesn't even wanna think about uh, American independence. Now, there's a, a lot of ways and means at the strategist's disposal to achieve his desired objectives. Uh, but during this lecture, I'm going to concentrate on the military aspects. British military strategy uh, was run by these two gentlemen here primarily. On, uh, these are the Howe brothers. On the left is General Sir William Howe, the, the British commander-in-chief in North, uh, North America, uh, and uh, minus Canada. And on the right is his brother, Admiral Sir Richard Howe, who commands the Royal Navy in American waters. So um, the, the British, these, these British uh, commanders um, they, they try to get some ter territorial gains. They hope that they can destroy the American forces. They capture some key American cities. They hope later to split the colonies in two. 
Um, the Royal Navy will support ground operations primarily, uh, and uh, ultimately, Howe will want to seek a decisive battle. Uh, they find that there is really, really difficult to, to, to uh, pacify the Americans with the amount of troops uh, they have. They just, they find out pretty quickly they don't have enough. The, um, on the American side, there's George Washington, of course, he's the uh, commander in chief. Um, they, it starts, the American strategy starts as a war of posts. What am I talking about there? It's, it's basically defending a series of fixed positions. Um, they, they assume that the Brits are gonna fight as stupidly as they did at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which is a dubious assumption. Howe fails to go along with that in New York in the summer and fall of 76. And after being beaten soundly in New York, George Washington begins to adopt a modified Fabian strategy. What, what is a Fabian strategy? It's a strategy named after the Roman general Fabius Maximus during the Second Punic War, where they, uh, the Romans and then now George Washington will, um, his, his major goal is to protect the army uh, at, at all costs, fight only when conditions are very, very favorable and thus wear down the British with militia supported by continental troops, hit and run raids, Later, they'll conduct guerrilla-like operations. It's basically a war of attrition and exhaustion. So the strategic situation in early 1777 is the British occupying New York City and not much more than that. Uh, the American army and George Washington barely escape destruction. Trenton and Princeton stops the bleeding and Washington is gonna concentrate on rebuilding and maintaining the army. So the Brits face a problem. After Trenton and Princeton, they realize that they really don't have enough men to control any liberated territory. So a new plan is, is needed for 1777. So one of the most fascinating and, and confusing things about the Saratoga campaign is how the British developed and executed their military strategy for 1777. Now, these are the four men who would play the largest role in creating and executing British military strategy in 1777. So clockwise from top, you've got King George III, who was heavily involved in strategy development and personnel decisions. On the right is General Sir William Howe, the commander in chief in North uh, America with his headquarters in New York City. Uh, at the bottom, Lieutenant General John Burgoyne, who had been second in command in Canada, but was now in London in late 76, early 77. And on the left there is Lord George Germain. He's a former general, and now he's Secretary of State for the colonies. He's responsible for managing the war in America. So in late 1776 and early 1777, both Burgoyne and Howe offer up competing plans for ending the rebellion. And it was ultimately up to Germain with, with the King's input to reconcile these two plans and to issue guidance that would give British arms the best chance for success. Now, because, because Burgoyne is in London, he's able to press his case directly to the King and Lord Germain in January of 1777. So this is his plan. He calls for three converging columns using Lake Champlain and Lake George as invasion routes for the main body coming down from Canada. You can see that from the red arrow. Seize Ticonderoga, gain loyalist support, and reach Albany by the fall. Uh, a supporting force will come down uh, into Lake Ontario and then into New York from the west down the Mohawk River Valley to Albany. Uh, and there to link up with the main force. And then both of those uh, columns will link up with Howe's army coming up the Hudson River from New York City. The idea was to defeat the Northern American army as it presents itself, split the more rebellious New England colonies from the rest of America by gaining control of the Hudson Highlands and the River Valley, and then conduct further unspecified operations into New England. Now, um, oh, excuse me about that. Let me get rid of that. There we go. On paper, you know, it's a very imaginative plan, but it's extremely complex. In reality, it'd be difficult to pull off today, let alone in the late 18th century because of distance time, weather, logistics, challenges over very, very rough, unforgiving wilderness terrain. But it was enthusiastically embraced by both the King and Lord Germain. Now Howe's plan is gonna change several times, but the final verdict, or excuse me, the final version called for him taking Philadelphia. And in the process, he hoped that he could lure Washington and the main American army into a battle in which Howe could destroy the main American army and thus win the war. Because by, by early 1777, Howe realized that George Washington and the main American army 
was the, was the true center of gravity of the American rebellion. Now, when Howe first presented his plan, Germain assumed that he would march from New York City uh, to Philadelphia overland. Um, uh, but Howe had no stomach for that kind of operation because it would require securing his lines of communications back to New York City. And his separated garrisons had already suffered from American raids throughout the winter. So instead, he wants to use the Royal Navy commanded by his brother to transport his army by sea to Philadelphia. Now, there's a lot of good things about going by sea, but as it turned out, speed was not one of them. Now, at any rate, once he threatened Philadelphia, he assumed George Washington would be forced to defend it because that's the seat of Congress uh, and that he would then have his decisive battle. So these are the two competing plans. The huge challenge for the British was, was to either pick one of those options and go with it or somehow coordinate the two into one coherent military strategy for 1777. Now, one of the major problems with reconciling these competing plans was the tyranny, what I call the tyranny of distance. The location uh, of all the, these key decision makers, those key four decision makers, um, uh, are, are different. So you've got the three of them, the King, Howe, or excuse me, the King, Germain, and Burgoyne are all in London, and Howe, the commander-in-chief, is in New York, 3,000 miles in between. It could be almost three months or more for an exchange of messages. So, uh, you know, the Americans don't have that problem, obviously. So, as you can see, coordinating a strategy is going to be really, really difficult, and so the British you know, the British have a real hard time doing that. So as I mentioned, it was up to Lord George Germain, Secretary of State for the Colonies, to reconcile these two proposals and to issue the orders to make it happen. So what ends up happening, as you might expect with that 3,000 mile distance, is confusion will reign, orders will cross as they cross the Atlantic back and forth, messages will cross. And what ends up happening is Germain approves Burgoyne's plan. He also approves Howe's plan. But once he tells Howe that once um, he seizes Philadelphia and destroys Washington army, Washington's army, then he's supposed to help Burgoyne. But Howe doesn't receive clear instructions to assist Burgoyne until he's already at sea heading for Philadelphia. By that time, it's way too late. So it gets very, very confusing. Now, in my book, there's a detailed, you know, I spent a lot of time on this. Uh, I also have a detailed appendix, appendix in the book tracing all these orders and letters going back and forth when they were sent, when they were received. And so you can kind of connect the dots and see how uh, 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 it was almost impossible to come up with a coherent strategy. So with the King's and Germain's approval in his pocket, Burgoyne sets sail for England and he arrives at Quebec in early May to prepare his army to invade New York via Lake Champlain. At the same time, Howe, who remember, he's the commander in chief, he also received orders from Germain and the king approving his plan with just a suggestion that he should uh, support Burgoyne once he, once he finishes in Philadelphia. Now to temper Burgoyne's expectations, Howe writes him in Canada telling him not to expect any help from the main army because he was instead heading for Philadelphia and he wasn't going to be able to assist him. But Burgoyne presses on anyway, confident and totally unconcerned. So what were some of the problems? Well, there's no overarching military strategy. There's no overarching person in charge. There's no clearly defined uh, objective. Um, uh, the closest to that was, was Howe's part of the strategy. Um, so there's, Howe has no consideration really for what the Northern Army is doing. Uh, Burgoyne ignores Howe's warning. They really don't cooperate at all. Um, and then there's this notion of, well, if they are able to link up, what happens after that? So the biggest problem is there's no overall, uh, uh, overall coordinated military strategy. There's instead two uncoordinated campaigns taking place. And everything that happens in the Saratoga campaign will flow from this flawed strategy. So what are, what are Burgoyne's objectives? Well, Burgoyne and his almost 10,000 man army will depart from Canada on the 14th of June, uh, 1777. They'll arrive outside Ticonderoga on the 2nd of July. 
Uh, the, other, the other column uh, that's going to go down the Mohawk River is commanded by uh, General St. Leger. His force of about uh, 1,800 men will leave on the 23rd of June. They'll arrive at the Mohawk River on the 2nd of August. Howe's main force uh, will be loaded on ships on the 8th of July, but they're not able to set sail uh, on the 20 until the 23rd of July for Philadelphia, and that's because of contrary wind. And so they don't land at the head of the Chesapeake Bay south of Philadelphia until a month later on the 25th of August. The main American army in New Jersey is commanded by George Washington and the, um, uh, the American Northern army is commanded by Major General Philip Schuyler. There you can see, okay. So here are the comparison of forces. And of course, we're gonna be focused on that Northern uh, campaign there. The American Northern Army and the British Northern and the British Army from Canada. There you can see. Um, so it's about the Americans have about seven thousand. The British have start off with about ten uh, ten thousand five hundred troops. Um, the British Army consists mainly of British regulars, German mercenaries, Canadians, and Native Americans. Uh, he wanted Burgoyne wanted a thousand Native Americans, but he only got about five hundred. Uh, St. Leger's uh, 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 force is largely made of North, uh, uh, Native Americans, um, but also uh, British forces, uh, German forces, uh, and also Canadians. The Americans uh, are continentals and militia continentals. Uh, of course, I'm talking to a, a, an audience full of uh, uh, Revolutionary War experts. You know what continentals are, uh, really the American regular army. Uh, consisting of regiments drawn from the states. And of course, militias are those short-term local troops. And during this campaign, they came primarily from New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. General Philip Schuyler commanding the Northern Department, including Fort Ticonderoga and the Northern Army. He's a native New Yorker. Uh, he lived in the Saratoga area. He's an upper-class sort of patrician kind of guy. He comes across as a bit haughty. He's not particularly well liked by the soldiers, uh, especially by the militia troops and New Englanders. He's not liked, nor is he trusted. So let's look at how the campaign played, played out. We'll start with Burgoyne's initial invasion. Uh, his first step was to take Fort Ticonderoga, which Burgoyne assumed would be the toughest part of his campaign. Now, as I already mentioned, Burgoyne and his army departed Canada on the 14th of June, and they arrive at Fort Ticonderoga on the 2nd of July. Now, through some skillful maneuvering, Burgoyne is able to convince the American commander, Major General uh, Arthur Sinclair, he's the, the guy on the left there, uh, that his position was hopeless. Uh, Burgoyne outnumbers the Americans about two to one. That's a picture of Fort Ticonderoga there. I'm sure many of you have visited uh, that uh, beautiful place. And Sinclair, Sinclair rather, uh, orders the evacuation of the fort on the 5th of July after offering almost no resistance at all. Now, I'm pretty critical of uh, General Sinclair's leadership in the book. Um, uh, now, so in a matter of days, Burgoyne had taken possession of the great fortress at Ticonderoga. Now, it's impossible to overstate the negative impact on the Americans caused by the loss of Ticonderoga. Washington Congress and nearby state governments are, are absolutely appalled that Sinclair and Schuyler had allowed this to happen. They believed the fort was almost impregnable. The easy victory also though, it fed Burgoyne's overconfidence and hubris since he had initially believed that taking Ticonderoga would be the most difficult part of his campaign. So what's Washington doing during all this time? Washington and the army are near Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, as commander in chief, he has many duties. He has to keep Congress informed. He has to respond to congressional questions and taskings. He has to incorporate foreign officers, feed, equip, and train his armies, all of his armies, not just his own army, communicate with governors uh, for militia support, uh, logistics, all that. And in the summer of 1777, most of his attention is focused on trying to figure out what Howe and his main army are going to do. But throughout it all, he had his eyes on what's going on 300 miles to the north. And he supported the panicky Major General Schuyler with wise counsel, advice, support, and with reinforcements that Schuyler definitely are, are desperately needed. Most importantly, uh, the most important help I argue that he sent uh, Schuyler was experienced leaders in the form of experienced leaders. So he sends Benedict Arnold up there, his most aggressive combat commander. 
He sends Benjamin Lincoln, Major General Benjamin Lincoln, who had a really good relationship with Massachusetts militia. He sends other general officers, Nixon, Glover. Uh, he also will ultimately send his most elite force, Colonel Daniel Morgan and his 500 riflemen from the main army. And he orders additional reinforcements as well. Washington has this strategic sense that was lost on the British commanders. In other words, he sees the entire theater of operations as a whole. This is something Howe did not. Washington knew that operations in the North would affect his and the war effort. And, and as the commander in chief, he's not just focused on what his army is doing. He's trying to coordinate an overall military strategy as best he can. This Howe does not do. So I, I talk a lot about Washington's uh, role in the Saratoga campaign uh, in my book. Um, uh, to me, it's a central role. So now we've talked about Burgoyne's easy capture of Ticonderoga. Now let's look, let's look at the supporting column uh, that's supposed to go down the Mohawk River. So there you can see uh, that's uh, uh, Sinclair's, or excuse me, St. Leger's force uh, heading down the Mohawk River. So as I already mentioned, he leaves Canada on the 23rd of July uh, and he approaches the Mohawk River. As he approaches the Mohawk River, he encounters Fort Stanwix, thought to be in ruins, but instead manned by American soldiers. St. Leger had to defeat that fort before proceeding. So on the 2nd of August, he begins a siege. Now the Americans were outnumbered there three to one, worse odds than those faced by the Americans at Ticonderoga. The American garrison at Stanwix under the inspired leadership of their commander, uh, Colonel Peter Gansevoort resisted all efforts by St. Leger to take the fort uh, or force it to surrender. So the contrast between the leadership of Gansevoort at Fort Stanwix and St. Sinclair at Ticonderoga could not be more stark. So on, six, on the 6th of August, not long after the British began their siege of Fort Stanwix, an American militia relief force was ambushed on their way to the fort and almost destroyed by a detachment sent by St. Leger, composed in large part of Native Americans. The fighting during the Battle of, of Oriskany was horrific and both sides suffered heavy casualties, which led to the mass desertion of St. Leger's Indian allies. Two weeks later, Major General Benedict Arnold led a detachment of the Northern Army up the Mohawk to relieve the Stanwix garrison. Now, by that time, most of uh, his Indians had deserted. So St. Leger realized that his mission had failed. And, um, uh, and so he gathers his men and returns to Canada in late August. Arnold marches to Stanwix, made sure the fort was no longer at risk. And then he quickly returns to the main army north of Albany. So Gansevoort and the Stanwix garrison had held out for 22 days. And the siege of Stanwix, uh, to me, is one of the most inspiring stories of the entire campaign. And, and I cover it uh, pretty extensively in the book. And it was the first good news for the Americans in a very, very long time. So how, with how going to Philadelphia and not coming up the Hudson River, and now St. Leger uh, abandoning the effort to push down the Mohawk River Valley to meet Burgoyne and Albany, Two of those three columns from the original plan are now out of the picture. Burgoyne is now on his own. So now we're gonna uh, zero in on that box that you see on the map uh, where the rest of the campaign will play out. You can see, I think, um, just in this very, very quick overview that there's so many moving parts to this campaign. Um, uh, it's not just those battles at Saratoga in September and October. There's all these other things leading up to it. And you can't understand what happens at those battles unless you understand what's going on in the rest of the campaign. So we'll do a close-up of operations from Ticonderoga to Saratoga. And I'll, I'll try to zip through this fairly quickly. So we've got plenty of time for Q&A. So, um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, he's, uh, Burgoyne is able to seize Ticonderoga without a fight on the 6th of July. Uh, he leaves a garrison behind. The American garrison will march overland to the east. Uh, they're closely pursued by the British. And on the 7th of July, uh, there's a small but important battle of Hubberton, uh, which is that other uh, little red blotch there, uh, where the British uh, pursuit will catch up to uh, Sinclair's rear guard. And the rear guard is able to stop. The Americans lose the battle, but they're able to stop the, the British pursuit. Uh, Burgoyne also catches and scatters other escaping and retreating Americans at Skeensboro, uh, which is at the very south tip uh, of um, 
uh, Lake Champlain, current uh, present day Whitehall. After losing Ticonderoga, Schuyler concentrates the army at Fort Edward. And you can see the, the, um, the blue uh, square there, that's the, the army. So Burgoyne moves his entire army to Skeensboro on the 11th of July. This takes a little bit of time. He then stays at Skeensboro until the 24th of July, almost two full weeks, a delay that allows Schuyler, the American commander, to destroy bridges, block roads, and basically harass the British. In the meantime, reacting to the awful news of the loss of Ticonderoga, Washington sends Benedict Arnold to help Schuyler, and when he arrives on the 24th of July, he immediately injects energy into the Northern Department, the Northern Army. As Burgoyne slowly advances south from Skeensboro to Fort Edward, Schuyler pulls the American Army back, as you can see on the map. Burgoyne, who had departed Canada without enough logistics uh, support, soon finds himself short of supplies food, fodder and, fodder, and particularly transport, horses, wagons, carts, things like that. And as the Americans fall back, they continue to delay and harass the slowly advancing British. Um, Schuyler's pleas to New England governors for militia reinforcements uh, fall on deaf ears. Uh, he does a good job delaying Burgoyne and rebuilding the shattered Northern Army, but there's very little indication of that in his panicky and pessimistic messages to his superiors. Washington and Congress. So Burgoyne arrives at Fort Edward on the 1st of August. He stays another two weeks and then he slowly marches to Fort Miller. You can see that on the map. He stays at Fort Miller for almost three weeks, gathering 30 days of logistics for a push on Albany. The logistics strain and supply shortages are really starting to uh, tell at this point. While at Fort Miller, he sends out a large detachment of primarily German troops uh, to seize cattle and supplies known to be at Bennington, Vermont. And on the 16th of August, the Battle of Bennington takes place. This is when British General, or excuse me, American General John Stark and his predominantly New Hampshire militia force destroy that foraging expedition, uh, uh, Burgoyne's foraging expedition. So Burgoyne loses almost a thousand men in this engagement. So after the Bennington disaster, Burgoyne has basically two options. He can retreat back to Ticonderoga, a defensible place where he could spend the winter, or continue to push south and drive on to Albany. He decides to drive on to Albany. He would later claim that this decision uh, uh, was because his orders offered him no alternative. Of course, this is nonsense. Commanders are paid the big bucks to use their judgment. So uh, now he's got, he's, he's got all the information he needs, yet he decides to move on. Uh, also, by this time, he knew that St. Leger had had to retreat back to Canada and that Howe was almost certainly heading for Philadelphia. So in other words, he has all the information he needs. Now, George Washington and Congress were finally fed up with Schuyler's relentless negativity, and so they relieve him of command of the Northern Department, and he's replaced by Major General Horatio Gates. Gates arrives at the Northern Army headquarters north of Albany shortly after the Battle of Bennington in late August to take command from Schuyler. And he soon starts edging the army north to Stillwater. You can see that on the map. And, and then ultimately to a place called Bemis Heights, about four miles to the north. There he'll dig in and wait. Uh, like Schuyler, Gates asked for militia reinforcements and this time his requests were heeded in part because he, Gates is popular, but also because of Burgoyne's uh, and his, and mainly his Native American depredations uh, throughout the entire area and this continued invasion threat. So New England militia begin to arrive by the hundreds and then ultimately the thousands. Burgoyne will cross the Hudson to the West Bank on the 13th of September, essentially cutting off his line of communications back to Ticonderoga. So who are these two men? Well, Gates on the left is a former British army officer who served in the French and Indian War in North America. He marries an American girl afterwards, settles in the colonies, quickly becomes Americanized. So when the war begins, uh, he offers his service to the Continental Army and he serves under Washington. In 1777, he's about 50 years old. Uh, he's a good manager, he understands logistics, he believes in defensive warfare. He also understood how best to employ American militia forces and he doesn't disparage them like a lot of his expatriate uh, contemporaries. He desperately wants an independent command. And although he was a uh, 
and, and he thought he was a much better leader than Washington. And all the two, although the two men have a very good relationship early in the war, it had deteriorated by 1777. We're going on the right. He's this career British uh, cavalry officer who's 55 years old in 1777. He was known to be very aggressive and flamboyant. He's also can be arrogant and pompous, but he was also very well liked by his troops because he was also always concerned about his welfare, not always all that common uh, amongst uh, British officers, senior officers. Uh, he served in America early in the revolution, but he didn't have much respect for Americans uh, or American soldiers. And this was magnified after the easy capture of Ticonderoga. He's a playwright, he's a member of parliament, he's a favorite of King George III. Despite serving almost his entire adult life in the British army, this is his first real independent command. So by mid-September, the two armies are almost equal. So here's a comparison, about 6,700 Americans uh, and about 6,500 British. So, so they're pretty evenly matched. But now Burgoyne only has, if you notice there, he only has about 50 Native Americans left. The rest had deserted after Bennington. They start seeing, they start sensing potential disaster. They all leave. And so when they leave, Burgoyne has really lost some of his eyes and ears of the army because he used those Indians uh, to collect intelligence, screen his force from the prying eyes of the Americans. And now that's going to be severely limited. Uh, this is a photo I took a couple of years ago from Bemis Heights. This is the American positions looking north. You can see from this image that the position, <clears throat> excuse me, commands both the Hudson River and the road to Albany. Now, as I mentioned, on the 13th of September, Burgoyne crosses to the west bank of the Hudson and moves slowly south until he's only a couple miles from Gates and the American army dug in on Bemis Heights. Because he had lost almost all of his Indians, Burgoyne really doesn't have a good, uh, doesn't have any good intelligence on the American dispositions. But he reasons that Gates left or his west flank uh, could be turned. So his main effort is going to be toward that end. Get around Gates' left flank and move on to Albany. Major General Benedict Arnold, who commands the American left flank, uh, also knew about this vulnerability and figured Burgoyne would try to take advantage of it. And the aggressive Arnold urges Gates to strike preemptively, but the more cautious Gates would not allow it. So finally, on the 19th of September, 1777, these two main armies are going to collide. And the first Battle of Saratoga, also known as the Battle of Freeman's Farm, is going to commence. Now, I see I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to zip through this really quick uh, because I want to uh, I want to save time for, for, for questions. So basically, Burgoyne is going to advance uh, with three columns. Uh, and they, they, make good, uh, they make good progress, uh, except for the Germans uh, on, the, on the east there, the, the, on the right. They run into some fog uh, and they have to slow down, but uh, they make good, good progress. Uh, uh, Arnold uh, goes to Gates and recommends that the Americans uh, send some forces out to to uh, uh, face the uh, British advance. Gates agrees and they send out Morgan's riflemen and also some light infantry. And Morgan will attack there in the center that you can see. Uh, Morgan is reinforced, he's forced to fall back. Um, a couple other American brigades are sent into the fight uh, and the British center column begins to be um, heavily engaged. Uh, the British um, uh, other column comes to help and also uh, an, another um, uh, detachment from the Germans come and hit the Americans on their right flank and the Americans will be forced ultimately to fall, fall back. So there's only a small uh, fraction of the US forces are engaged. Uh, Gates retains the bulk of his forces behind his fortifications on Bemis Heights because he wants to make sure he's, he's blocking the Albany Road and the Hudson River. So Burgoyne technically wins this battle because he held the ground, but he suffers twice the casualties that the Americans do, uh, casualties that he can ill afford. Now Burgoyne is faced with another key decision. Do I push on to Albany or do I fall back? He, he directs his army to prepare defensive positions and dig in. And as he ponders his option, Lieutenant General uh, Henry Clinton throws him a lifeline. So Lieutenant General Henry Clinton, Howe's second in command, had been left behind in New York City with instructions to hold the city and, if possible, to help Burgoyne, as Howe had taken the bulk of the forces to Philadelphia. 
So by the time of the first battle of Saratoga, the last message Clinton had received from Burgoyne was dated on the 6th of August, which stated that everything was going just fine. But then on the 21st of September, he receives the shocking note that Burgoyne had, in fact, uh, from Burgoyne that things were not going well. In fact, things were very dire. Uh, Clinton replied that he would try to move up the Hudson in an attempt to draw Gates off of Burgoyne. So it took Clinton a while to get everything ready, and he starts his move north on the 3rd of October. Shortly after Clinton departs, uh, Clinton receives a note from Burgoyne saying he's now down to 500 men facing 10,000 Americans. So uh, uh, the British quickly seize the American uh, fortresses at uh, Forts Montgomery and Clinton on the 6th of October, and they continue on to present day Kingston, New York, uh, desperately trying to contact Burgoyne with the goal of relieving him or at least trying to supply him or to force Gates to send troops to face Clinton, the new threat. But there's just too many American militia. And so uh, the American, uh, excuse me, the British relief expedition is forced to turn back. Burgoyne in the meantime is forced to cut rations twice as he waits in vain for Clinton to arrive, even firing rockets every day, hoping to guide the relief force to him. But Clinton never reaches any closer than 70 miles from Burgoyne. So while this futile rescue attempt is playing out, there's also a drama on the American side. Gates and his second in command, Benedict Arnold, have a bitter quarrel over who is to have the lion's share of the credit for the 19th September battle and over what to do next. And for almost two weeks, the two generals are engaged in this nasty war of letters, uh, even though their headquarters are only a half a mile apart. But contrary to the standard account of Saratoga, by the time of the second battle of Saratoga, they were once again able to work with each other. Now, it's almost impossible to know exactly the number of soldiers in Gates' command after the first battle, but the army probably numbered at least 11,000 troops by the time the second battle of Saratoga takes place. At any rate, Gates now has an overwhelming numerical superiority uh, as you know, militia forces are pouring in day and night. But, but Burgoyne still has a chance, um, uh, but he has to make a quick decision. He's getting weaker while Gates is getting stronger. But instead of pulling back, he decides to, to stay where he is. He decides to send out a, a large reconnaissance force uh, to look for food and fodder and also to see if it would be possible to make that dash toward Albany. It's a desperate attempt, uh, but he decides to try it. Again, I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Uh, what happens is he sends out this uh, um, uh, on the morning of the 7th of October, Burgoyne sends out this 1700 man reconnaissance force. He actually personally leads it into battle. Uh, the Americans send out Morgan again and his riflemen and the light infantry. Uh, they take this, uh, this uh, unit under fire. Uh, and pretty soon uh, they are hard pressed. Uh, Arnold again requests uh, additional reinforcements. Gates approves, they send out uh, another brigade. Uh, and pretty soon, the, uh, the uh, British and Germans are forced to fall back uh, uh, after being heavily pressed. Uh, and you can see them doing that. They'll fall back into their fortifications, but in total disarray. And Burgoyne, excuse me, uh, Arnold senses an opportunity, and he personally leads an attack into the far, the British far west fortification. You can see that right there. Uh, he's, he's seriously wounded there, uh, and the German commander is killed, but that fortification is taken by the Americans. And because they take the far uh, flank uh, fortification on, in Burgoyne's line, Burgoyne is forced to order a retreat, uh, which he does. First, he orders his men to fall back, and then he, he um, uh, uh, orders a full-fledged retreat to the north. Gates' army slowly follows uh, as more and more militia arrive until the American army exceeds almost 17,000 men. And soon the exhausted British army will grind to a halt after traveling only about eight miles near a little town of Saratoga, which is present day Schuylerville, New York. And there they're quickly surrounded by the Americans. After several days of tense negotiations, terms were agreed to on the 16th of October. Uh, Burgoyne had left Canada with 10,000 men, 
and only 15 weeks after seizing Ticonderoga, he ends up surrendering almost 6,000 soldiers. And on the 17th of October, while the American band plays Yankee Doodle, Burgoyne surrenders his, armies to, his army to Gates. And as depicted in this famous Trumbull painting, now hanging in the US Capitol Rotunda. So there's huge short-term implications, obviously. The British only have two large field armies in North America. Now they've just lost one. American army soars. Uh, American uh, morale soars, British morale obviously plummets. There's uh, renewed opposition in parliament to, uh, to the war. Now the Brits have to really worry about a wider war with France and, and maybe Spain. Um, they, they offer Americans favorable terms after Saratoga, but by this time it's too little and too late. There are of course long-term implications. Two days after the French learn of the victory uh, uh, on the 4th of December, uh, Louis XVI orders that negotiations be restarted with the Americans that will lead to an alliance with the US. There you see Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, who led uh, the diplom American diplomatic uh, contingent in Paris. Um, to the left there is uh, Minister Vergennes, who is the Fr a French foreign minister, minister. And on the right there is Louis XVI. And the result of the great uh, diplomacy and the American uh, victory at Saratoga is the Franco-American alliance is signed on the 6th of February, 78. Uh, Britain declares war on France on the 17th of March, 1778. So Saratoga will lead directly to what Britain feared the most, war against one or more continental power while trying to subdue the rebellion in America. So France in 1778, of course, and then Spain, which would also join the war in June of 79. So let's circle back real quick where we began, strategy. Uh, the British will change out all of their major commanders. They'll, they'll hand the commander in chief job to uh, Sir Henry Clinton there in the middle. Uh, they change their political objectives slightly. Now they're going to basic, they wanna end the rebellion, but they offer Americans uh, basically everything they want short of independence. And of course, the Americans will, um, uh, will reject that. Uh, so they, they decide to embark on more of a naval war, uh, defend the homeland, attack uh, the French West Indies, now focus on France, and ultimately they'll embark on what historians will call the Southern strategy. Um, Winston Churchill once said that the only thing worse than fighting with an ally is fighting without one. So the Americans quickly discovered the truth of Churchill's statements. Uh, having the French on our side wasn't a cure-all. Uh, they proved to be difficult allies, but still uh, they start with welcome naval support. And finally, in 1780, the French will land an army in America that would ultimately combine with Washington's, ending in the final and decisive American victory at Yorktown in October of 1781. So quite simply, the Americans could never have had a Yorktown without a Saratoga. Indeed, none of the elements of Washington's military strategy would have yielded lasting results without Saratoga. Nor would Great Britain have faced what was essentially a global war if they hadn't suffered what Pitt the Elder called the melancholy disaster. Thus, the American victory at Saratoga changed the entire character of the revolution. And although Saratoga was not sufficient to guarantee American independence, it was necessary. It was, as one American general wrote after Burgoyne's surrender, the complete victory. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Great, and I've seen a few questions come through, but again, please go ahead and submit those using the Q&A function. Um, our first question comes from Tom Crocker. Um, why did Howe want to go by sea to the head of the Chesapeake Bay rather than sail up the Delaware and the Delaware? directly attack Philadelphia? Under yeah, the cover that's a great, and, yeah. yeah that, that's a great question. Um, I, two reasons, I think. Uh, the first reason is he's trying to keep Washington off balance, and he does a really good job of it. Washington, if you read, I read every Washington letter throughout this period. Um, Washington, it just drives him crazy because he doesn't know what Howe's going to do. He thinks he's, he's potentially going uh, up the Hudson to support Burgoyne. Uh, or he, Washington at first thinks that's the most likely thing that he's going to do when he loads on ships. Uh, or he could be going to Philadelphia. Or he could be going to Newport, Rhode Island. Or he, Washington even thinks when he sails back past the mouth of the Delaware, 
there. He thinks, oh, he's going to Charleston. And of course, Washington can't do anything about that. Uh, there's no way he could march that fast to, to influence that at all. In fact, throughout the entire period, Washington laments the fact that he's got no naval support uh, and that Howe can basically move uh, at will by sea. So that's one reason to keep Washington off balance. And he does a pretty good job of that. And the other thing is there are, it was known that there were American fortifications guarding uh, the uh, Delaware River and its approaches to Philadelphia. So Howe wants to avoid all that. And so he thinks by sailing up the Chesapeake and landing at Head of Elk, uh, which is present day Elkton, Maryland, uh, that, that he can, um, uh, he, he, it could be easier and he could avoid all those uh, American uh, forts along the, um, the Delaware. In fact, it's gonna take how a while to clear those forts later on so he can bring his logistics support uh, into Philadelphia once he actually takes the city. So, so basically two reasons, that's a great question. Great, our next question comes from John and Nancy Gardner. Did the French give more freedom to their commanders? It seems Destaing, De Grasse, and Rochambeau were making their own decisions uninhibited by Versailles. Yeah, they, they, um, they do give them uh, a lot of discretion. Uh, and, and mainly because you know, it's almost impossible to do any micromanaging from Europe. And the Brits find that out. Germain, you know, in, in some ways, um, Germain's trying to have it, the British, on the British side, Germain's trying to have it both ways. Um, he tells his commanders in North America, hey, at all times, use your discretion. But then he gives them very, very detailed guidance or what he says, you know, suggestions. Uh, and so, of course, if you're a senior British commander and he's your boss, you're going, well, you know, a suggestion means I want you to do it. So, so Germain is really essentially trying to micromanage the war from London. And again, when you have that, you know, two to three month period uh, when or it, it could take two to three months to send a message and get a reply, not to mention then send another message to follow up on that reply, um, it makes it almost impossible. So the, the French provide their guys with a little bit of, uh, uh, of um, uh, freedom. Uh, and it's really what the British should have done. The British should have given their commanders in North America broad guidance. Look, I want you to destroy Washington's army. That's going to end the rebellion. You figure out how to do it. You tell me what you need resource-wise. I'll do my best to give it to you. And I'm going to trust you to figure out how to do it. Uh, but that's not what they did. So a great, great question. And it provides a good contrast to how the, how the British were trying to do things. Great. Our next question comes from um, Debbie Abbott. Were maps reliable at this time? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another great question. No, they weren't reliable at all, Debbie. Um, they were, you know, the, the Americans, obviously, they're going to have a little bit better maps, but you're mainly going to rely on local knowledge. So it's, that's so, so critically important to have the local knowledge of the area. Uh, and of course, the British don't have that. They have some generalized maps. They have maps from, you know, that were made during the French and Indian War. So they've got some of that. You know, obviously, they're going to show the major roads. They're going to show the major water courses. They're going to show the major settlements. They'll show the major forts because most of the forts that we're talking about during this entire campaign were built during the French and Indian War. So they're going to have some familiarity with that. Some of their senior commanders will have some local knowledge because they served in the French and Indian War in that area, uh, but none of their junior officers have, obviously. So to me, to, you know, in my mind, um, you know, the maps are good to do sort of the big hand movements, but when you're talking about the, you know, which road do I take that will come out on this guy's flank uh, during a battle, they just don't have that. And so that's why it's so important that you know the they they have they're able to send out patrols. They have the folks with the local knowledge. That's why Schuyler did such a good job after the British seized Ticonderoga because he's I mean he lives in that area. He's lived his entire life in that area. He knows where all the roads are. He knows where the vulnerable roads are. He can provide guidance to his troops on where they can. Um, best slow down the, the, the British advance and things like that. So Schuyler was, uh, uh, played an important role before he was relieved of his command. So great, great question. 
And we've had two folks submit questions about the murder of Jane McNay. Uh, McRae. Or Mc, right? McRae. Um, could you speak about that and the connection to Native Americans in the war? Right. So <clears throat> the the murder of Jane McRae, I've got a chapter on it, um, probably was the result of friendly fire. Uh, she was... Uh, kidnapped by, now, go back a second. Uh, what Burgoyne is doing, Burgoyne has, like I said, about 500 uh, Native Americans uh, attached to his, his army. They're very important for his army. They're used, again, for scouting, for reconnaissance, for screening his army from the prying eyes of American patrols, but also to go out and you know, do hit and, hit and run raids and things like that. He finds it very difficult to control them. Their way of war is just different from the European way of war. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the, the, these American uh, Native Americans are allying themselves with Burgoyne is they're looking for, you know, they're looking for spoils, they're looking for booty, uh, the hostages, all that, all that sort of thing. That's the Native American way of war. So. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of um, what the Americans consider and what most consider to be, you know, basically, you know, uh, uh, war crimes. I mean, they're, they're, they're killing people. They're, they're, they're basically in, um, indiscriminate in their killing. They're killing civilians. They're, they're killing Americans and loyalists because they're not, they're not differentiating. Uh, and so uh, Jane McRae is a loyalist. Uh, her um, her fiance, in fact, is a loyalist soldier, and so she finds herself uh, in the path of uh, Burgoyne's advance. She tries; she's getting ready to leave and get kind of get out of their way as they're heading uh, down uh, uh, near Fort Edward. Uh, and some Native Americans uh, basically kidnap her and start uh, taking them back to their camp. They taking them back to the American camp, or excuse me, the British camp. Uh, some American militia see this happening, try to rescue them, and they fire on the Native Americans. And what probably happened was she was hit by friendly fire and killed. And then what happened is the, uh, the uh, Native Americans who had captured her, now she's, she's dead. They basically scalp her as, you know, that's what they did to show, you know, um, their, their trophies. And so when, and, and so that gets around very, very quickly, obviously, and the Americans use it uh, as a very skillful propaganda tool. It also creates, uh, you know, a huge backlash against Burgoyne uh, in Britain because he's, the, you know, the American, excuse me, the British think that that's totally inhuman using Native Americans against the, uh, against the American uh, rebels. Uh, so it's all sorts of ramifications uh, take place after this. Um, Burgoyne conducts an investigation. He basically decides that um, uh, that uh, the uh, Native Americans aren't at fault. Uh, he's he's actually criti heavily criticized amongst his own army uh, for for that decision because the army itself isn't all that happy about having to serve with the Native Americans. So the Native Americans are really important to him, but they're a, they're a double-edged sword. Uh, the, the, he basically hands the Americans this, this great propaganda victory. Um, there's some, some question over whether the murder of Jane McRae caused a huge influx of militia to come out. I sort of doubt it. I think um, it happened too late in the campaign to have a major impact, uh, but, but certainly it had a major impact going forward. So great question. And we are a little bit over our time, but we'll wrap up with one final question um, submitted by Kieran O'Keefe. What role do you think Burgoyne's overestimation of loyalist support played in his defeat? Yeah, Karen, great. Uh, another, yeah, I just love the, my favorite, I was telling Kelsey, my favorite part of these things are, are the Q&A and having a, a great, um, uh, wonderful audience uh, asking these super questions, really, really enjoyable. Yes. Um, very, very uh, important. When you're coming up with, with a strategy, you, you, know, you obviously can't have 100% uh, 
good information. You're always going to, there's always going to be some gaps, right? And, but in order to fill those gaps, you still have to come up with your strategy. You have to come up with a plan. So to fill those gaps, you have to make assumptions. So one of the several assumptions that Burgoyne makes early on is he's going to get massive loyalist support when he moves into New York from Canada. In fact, one of the reasons why he's willing to take a risk of, of, of starting his campaign with all, without all the logistics he knew he was going to need is he thought he was going to be able to get those, you know, he's going to be able to fill that logistic shortfall because of all the loyalist support he was going to get. So again, making an assumption in, its, in and of itself is not bad. But if you're going to make an assumption, you also have to consider what if my assumption is not true, does not, does not uh, pan out. You have to come up with what we call today uh, in, in, in modern military planning, branches and sequels. What happens if that assumption doesn't play out? Well, I have to look for another source of support, or that means I have to bring more support with me, or it's gonna take longer for me to get to Albany. You have to, you have to at least consider what happens if your, if your uh, assumption doesn't uh, pan out. And as it turns out, even though most historians think there, there was a large number of loyalists in, uh, in New York when Burgoyne was conducting his campaign, most of them will hunker down and not provide any support. They're going to wait to see how this plays out. And, and you've got to, you know, I, I think that's, that's kind of human nature. And, and of course, that assumption does not pan out. And it's one of the many things that leads to uh, Burgoyne's downfall. Thanks. Great question.